All right. And that brings us to 1105 Eastern, which is our starting time for today's fireside chat. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Samson Magan. I'm the co founder and CEO of HealthSnap. Uh, we're an integrated virtual care platform for chronic disease management. Uh, co hosting with me is my co founder, Dr. Wesley Smith, who's our ch chief science officer. Uh, and today we have an awesome panel of healthcare experts ranging from uh, CMOs at large integrated health systems to um, FQHCs, uh, individuals with deep, deep value-based experience. Um, and we're going to be covering a lot of topics uh, on today's uh, chat. Um, I promise we'll make this as conversational and informative as possible. Uh, and the three main topic points for today's discussion are going to be around value-based care and chronic disease management supporting digital care innovation and transformation uh, within a large integrated system. And then last but not least, uh, deploying digital care programs within rural and underserved uh, patient populations. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass on to Dr. Smith for an intro on his end, and then we'll go through each of the guest speakers on today's uh, chat. Thank you, Samson. I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, as Samson mentioned, I'm the chief scientist at HealthSnap. I'm also a co-founder. I also work at the University of Miami, where I've chaired both our exercise physiology program and our graduate program in nutrition. And I've been currently focused on merging uh, telehealth with remote patient monitoring solutions um, to optimize patient outcomes and, and get patients engaged as uh, part of a proactive healthcare solution at HealthSnap. So I'm excited to talk to our, our panelists here today about, about value-based care paradigms and, um, and what we have on the docket. I'm excited to be here. Great. Thank you so much, Wes. Uh, Dr. Stark, maybe you could do a quick introduction on yourself, your organization, uh, and then maybe for, for each of the guest speakers here as well, share one thing that you're just super passionate about that you'd love to see uh, either change or changing within uh, healthcare and healthcare innovation. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Allison Stark. I am the Chief Medical Officer for the Montefiore Care Management Organization, which is the value-based and population health arm of the Montefiore Health System. Um, we are a, an 11 hospital system serving patients in the Bronx and into Westchester and the Hudson Valley. And our care management organization contracts with um, health plans and uh, uh, the federal and state governments to uh, do accountable care for populations. We have about 300,000 um, patients that are in some type of value-based contract. Um, and uh, we service them through our integrated delivery system. Um, by way of my background clinically, I'm an internist, geriatrician, and palliative care provider, um, and as chief medical officer, work across our, our, uh, our organization around quality uh, care management and utilization management. So in terms of what I'm super excited about, um, I, you know, with everything that's going on in telemedicine, including remote patient monitoring, I'm excited about the access that it provides um, in, ser in serving our population, especially where there are a lot of health disparities. So I think this can help um, level the playing field and also serve as an extension for overburdened um, providers in being able to provide excellent care for our population. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Stark. Andy? Hi, this is Andy Lowe. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Outer Cape Health Services. We're an FQHC community health center serving the outermost 10 towns of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I'm also the director of the Cape and Islands Area Health Edu Education Center. Uh, I have a faculty appointment at the UMass Medical School. And I'm also the president of the New England Rural Health Association. Uh, my, my real background and interest is in uh, rural health and particularly with regards to this discussion with uh, Equity, driving equity for vulnerable rural populations, particularly around telehealth, is there, this is a group that can be easily left behind because of things like the digital divide. Great, thank you so much, Andy. Conley, you're up. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, Samson. Uh, <clears throat> I am um, formerly the uh, head of value-based programs for Tenet Healthcare. Tenet is a national uh, healthcare company that owns acute care hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, uh, and another uh, number of other uh, ancillary provider entities nationwide. Um, 
for the last 10 years uh, of my career with, with Tenet, I oversaw all the value-based programs, which uh, involved a, a number of, of programs, uh, but included all of our uh, CMS value-based uh, initiatives, as well as those on the private sector. Uh, we uh, managed about half a million lives, a third of those in a Medicare ACO program. And then for the last 18 months before I left in June, I was also the CEO of a joint venture that Tenet and uh, Common Spirit have in Phoenix called Arizona Care Network. Uh, I, I really am pleased with just the trajectory that the industry has taken uh, in the last decade, I think it's unusual to say that you know CMS. I think really led the the, the transformation, but I think just the size of of CMS really helped to provide some consistency across the industry. Uh, and really, you know, some of the it sounds very basic to say, but just some of the foundational requirements of really paying attention to holistic care for patients and trying to meet them where their needs are. Sometimes, you know. What patients need is, uh, is is the easiest thing, you know, where to access and how to access care. So I, I really am very excited about uh, how the industry as a whole is embracing um, more ways for holistic care to be delivered more efficiently and, and better. Thanks for letting me join the conversation today. Of course. Thanks for being here, Conley. And Dr. Libby, we'll round up on your end. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Libby, and I'm the um, Clinical Director of Informatics at Advocate Health Services, the federally qualified health um, center that Andy Lowe described. I'm also the Medical Director for our largest site, our Harvestport Health Center, and uh, my clinical background is in family medicine, and I'm I still am half-time a primary care provider here uh, for all ages and do substance use disorder treatment and a little bit of urgent care here and there, too. So in rural health, we often do a little bit of everything and wear a lot of hats. Um, my background before medical school and part of why I'm interested in informatics was I had a background in physics and in education. Um, and my, my passion, I think, especially in this context, is in bringing patient-centered, team-based care um, to underserved communities and underserved organizations. Uh, I've worked in community health since I graduated medical school and had a National Health Service Corps scholarship to do that. Um, and I... I um, want to be able to apply those principles to get patients the highest quality care and the best patient experience possible, um, regardless of their insurance or ability to pay. Fantastic. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off with an overview question and, and allow Wes to, to take the first one. And then uh, if anyone would like to jump in after that, um, as I mentioned, we'll make this as conversational as possible. Um, I think over the last 18 months, as everyone touched on a little bit, we've seen a, a really massive transformation in care delivery. Our traditional care models as it comes to chronic disease management specifically um, is traditionally reactive. Um, it's episodic, delivered in the clinic. And as a result of COVID and enhancements in technology like telehealth and remote patient monitoring, we're seeing a paradigm shift in delivering care that is proactive, that's ongoing uh, and delivered in the home. And the way that we view that is that the paradigm shift of care being, being delivered in the clinic to the home supports the transitions from our traditional fee-for-service model to value-based payer arrangements that are designed to improve outcomes, access, uh, patient satisfaction, and provider satisfaction. Um, when it comes to chronic conditions specifically, which are diseases of lifestyle, um, this is a, an area where we can start really creating, and I'll use this word a lot, sustainability and making sure that the changes that we've seen over the last 18, month, uh, 18 months remain to be uh, implemented over the next one, two, five, or 10 years. So Wes, maybe you can start off with sharing your perspective and thoughts on how virtual care, whether it's telehealth and remote patient monitoring and a proactive system can help support the shift to value-based care initiatives long-term. Sure. Yeah, this is the most exciting time for me in my career. Um, you know, again, mainly as a professor, as I started out teaching future physicians, teaching pre-med classes, and it's um, uh, sort of a cliche statement that we've used a lot that healthcare should be healthcare, not disease care. 
Uh, it should be based on um, the value should be in the outcomes, which is why I'm so excited now uh, about this, this increased movement towards value-based care, especially as we start to see the integration of technology in a way that can be used to enhance care, as Samson said, right there in um, the patient's living room to make it more available. You know, I, I, um, as an only child, uh, took care of both of my parents who, were, who died early from chronic disease and were disabled for a long time prior to that. And it was just so arduous to make it to those doctor's appointments. It was, it was um, clear to me that, our, that lifestyle had played a role so it, it became a passion of mine for over 20 years now working in academia at first. How can we get some of these things uh, improved access, um, inclusion of technology, and a healthcare system focused on outcomes you know, infused into the healthcare system? I'm, I'm being faced with these future doctors every day in the classroom. What can we do about this? And, and now we're seeing it. So it, it's very exciting. There's obviously some things we're still learning and it's evolving, but we can say just from the data that we've seen um, in-house is a remote monitoring, just as an example with hypertensives, can lower blood pressure, just from monitoring blood pressure on a regular basis, can lower blood pressure in a hypertensive patient uh, medicinally, equivalent to like two low-dose antihypertensive medications. We're also seeing that the inclusion of telehealth, when it's focused on improving, especially in, in the aging population, improving their ability uh, to achieve self-management, and improve self-efficacy and health literacy, you, telehealth is, is enabling us to do that. We're seeing significant improvements in self-efficacy and health literacy in this population, which obviously is going to uh, translate as we'd expect towards improved health outcomes. So it's very exciting. Of course, the issue, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more today, is the tech resistance element and, and the accessibility element for these patients. It's, it's nice that we have uh, technology that can improve our delivery of healthcare, but we have to make sure that the people who tend to be the most tech resistant have access. Um, and, and the last thing I guess I'll just say on this front is just, you know, I have uh, a 19 year old stepdaughter who, you know, I tease her a lot because we have Publix, uh, a supermarket right across the street, and she's too lazy to go off the couch and go grocery shopping. She would still order uh, groceries to be delivered. And if you think about a 20 year old ordering deliveries because it's, it's easier than going to the shop at, to the supermarket, imagine a 70 year old heart failure patient having the access to be, do a lot of things for their healthcare at home versus having to get up and make that appointment. You know, this is what um, technology is enabling us to do if it's designed correctly um, and made more accessible. So um, I'm not sure uh, in terms of, you know, this was talking mainly about aging populations and their tech resistance, but I'm interested Andy, and, and what you're seeing for technology um, in the rural population and the accessibility problems and access to Wi-Fi and things there. So maybe you can, um, uh, if you want to add to some of the things that I said, but specific with regard to that population. Sure, Wes. Um, I think what we see with our rural populations is uh, things like th their infrastructure issues uh, in terms of not having access to broadband, not having access to uh, reliable cell service, those kind of things. And that certainly, uh, we talk about, about tech resistance, it, it, it's tech access. And in some case, it's people not trusting the technology because it, it goes, you know, goes in and out. I, I live in a, a rural area with not great broadband. And uh, sometimes I, I have to, you know, take my uh, video off the screen. Um, the other, one of the other considerations is that uh, nationally, rural populations are older and sicker than the rest of the population. So what we have is potentially, if we can't get telehealth services to those populations, we're creating an equity issue uh, around uh, older patients and people that are just, that are just isolated. Um, and it, these, I think people tend to think of rural populations as being, it, it could be uh, North Dakota or Alaska, but around New England, we have a lot of rural areas that are, uh, they're, they're not that far in terms of distance to urban centers, but they may as well be in Siberia in some respects. Uh, on the Outer Cape, it's, as most of you probably know, we have a long, thin peninsula there's only a single two-lane highway connecting the Outer Cape to the rest of the Cape. There's very intermittent and uh, 
uh, spotty public transit. So transportation is an issue for people to get services. Telehealth is really a modality we need to have, but if, if there are also a number of places, particularly on the Outer Cape, where you can have no cell coverage, or it can be depending on provider, uh, the service provider, uh, you could have none for AT&T, be okay for Verizon, something like that. So there's, there's all these there issues with infrastructure and so on. And um, the other, I think the other thing in terms of an older population, an older rural population is from the point of view of sustainability is we have to have parity with telehealth services that we, for reimbursement, the same as we would have for an office visit, because we have to make choices about how we're gonna deliver services based on whether we can keep our doors open because of reimbursement. We don't get reimbursed for audio only telehealth visits at the same level as we do for video visits. Um, and for remote patient monitoring, federally qualified health centers currently really can't get reimbursed very much at all. So until those issues are dealt with, we're gonna have a divide, uh, certainly a rural to urban kind of divide going on. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think one thing that um, you know, we've considered too, and it's not that every patient has this available to them, but those patients that have caregivers or, there's, or patients that have uh, family members that they are in contact with on a regular basis, trying to get them included in the care. So when it comes to medication compliance through technology, or it comes to reminding uh, individuals to, to take measurements on a regular basis and things like that, to be able to include a willing family member um, who's in touch with the patient on a regular basis uh, may help with part of the problem, but of course, not not everybody has that luxury as well. Um, from an engagement standpoint, yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, this is Conley. My mom is eighty five, and generally in, in pretty good health, but she's had hearing aids for a couple of decades, and she uh, she lives in Kansas City. She thankfully does not have problems with internet. Uh, accessibility, but she actually prefers to use her phone and she actually prefers to text because uh, it's, she doesn't have to take her hearing aid out. She doesn't have to turn her phone up. It's, you know, not screaming in her ear. And she has become very savvy and has used not me because I am not tech savvy, but my nieces to, you know, basically teach her, um, you know, what different apps she needs, uh, you know, how to, to navigate some of the social things. And I think your point's a great one. I think, you know, family members just have that conversation that could potentially go a long way to getting the elderly population comfortable um, with technology. It's just, it's been really interesting to see how, how advanced it's, she's become and how comfortable she's become in just a couple of years. Yeah, Connie, that's a, a, a great point. I appreciate you sharing the story there. Um, maybe we can start, you know, discussing about um, more around virtual care and how we've seen it support value-based initiatives, both from a, a system level and a patient level. Um, I mean, Dr. Sark, this is something that you live and breathe every single day. So I'm curious at, at uh, Monty, how you guys, um, some initiatives you had in place prior to the pandemic, um, and then during the pandemic, how you guys have maybe rethought your care delivery models to support your, your value-based initiatives and, and how you see that moving forward in the future? Sure. Um, I mean, I think we've um, always looked for innovative ways to outreach and engage patients. Um, we've historically, uh, you know, we have a, a pretty robust care management infrastructure. So we enroll and engage patients in care management and provide a lot of support to them um, as they navigate um, our health system. I think, you know, with the pandemic, um, a lot of the work we had done, we had done a lot of work um, telephonically. We started to try to capitalize on some of the video visit opportunities that really exploded um, within our health system um, and just creating a lot more access and, and connectivity to patients through that. Um, and I think with, um, you know, with the introduction of RPM and the opportunities to 
look at um, you know making it a sustainable model with you know with uh, with appropriate billing. We were excited about that opportunity to create that access point, that connection um, for patients with with chronic conditions. So we're you know we're early um, in in that journey where we've been building and spending a lot of time building our infrastructure so that we can. Um, be successful with us with a sustainable model, um, and we have a little bit of you know early information on how our patients are connecting to it. I think the ones that um, do in enroll and engage are pretty excited about it. I think uh, that connection has been uh, has been meaningful, and we've been able to kind of in a pilot setting um, show that uh, we can, we can keep patients engaged. We can. Um, escalate issues through our interdi interdisciplinary team structure. And so I think there's a lot um, that can come from that as we learn and scale. Um, and certainly from a value-based perspective, you know, being able to control um, previously uncontrolled uh, hypertensive patients will have lots of long-term um, clinical and, and value-based benefits. Um, plus, um, there's a, a really nice opportunity for us to um, uh, you know, CMS is now allowing, or HEDIS is now allowing the utilization of RPM for um, meeting some of the quality metrics around uncontrolled hypertension. So there are big opportunities there for us on the quality side as well um, that we're looking to uh, explore and leverage. Yeah, that's it's great information. And, um, you know, we're, we are definitely in the earlier days of, you know, really rethinking, I think, the care delivery models and being able to prove value. Um, I mean, maybe, Conley, you can, you can share a little perspective on what you think it will take to support this at scale as we think about it long term. Um, that's something that, you know, we, it's one thing, I think, to start a program and be able to, to demonstrate, you know, outcomes and, and patient satisfaction or, or clinical outcomes, but I'm curious to hear your perspective on you know, what you think it will take, um, whether it's a system or a patient or even, you know, healthcare entrepreneurs or startups or companies to, to promote this at scale um, and ensure that it stays uh, sustainable as you scale up as well. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great question. Um, in our networks, about 80% uh, of the participating physicians were independent versus employed. Uh, certainly the employed physicians were included in that, but um, that lends itself to, um, you know, a, a pretty big number of EMRs. Uh, and then in total, I would say about 30% of our managed population was in a CMS program in a Medicare ACO and about 70% were, um, were with the private sector with any number of, of payers. What has helped tremendously is when CMS and the payers consistently come together to support not just the technology, but to Andy's point, the reimbursement as well. Um, you know, primary care doctors are spread so thin, they're asked to do so much, and it's not unreasonable to, to reimburse them appropriately for supporting new technology that's going to, um, uh, that, that's going to be a lift administratively um, and technolo technically for their uh, for their practices. So, uh, um, I was very pleased um, in our negotiations with the, the private payers that they are generally very willing to support things that focus on prevention. Not a surprise. I'm not going to say anything earth shattering, but things that focus on prevention, things that you know. Um, really uh, support the, the chronic patient um, accessing lower cost or um, uh, lower care, uh, lower cost treatments. So I think it's important for, for the payers to maintain that focus and that perspective that investing alongside CMS in these technologies is really going to accelerate the implementation um, and then in concert with that is really the, the patient education. Um, we really found the, the, the payer community um, as well as CMS, but, but really the payer community to be um, really collaborative when we were wanting to, to put together patient education materials. And <clears throat> again, um, you know, the, the, as long as the, the, the focus was 
consistent with you know, with where they wanted to to go in terms of their uh, initiatives. We really, I, I think, um, it never moves fast enough for anybody, but um, really, I think is is the second component to sustainability here is um, collaboration on the patient education piece. I think it's interesting that you mentioned it never moves fast enough because I just imagine, I try to imagine where we'd be if it wasn't for the pandemic uh, with this movement in digital care. I feel right. like they pressed the accelerator <laughs> exactly. and it's still, yeah. I mean, it's still, moving, still moving pretty slowly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I feel like uh, what we've learned, and since it's a new area, of course, as we're adding digital care solutions into, into the paradigm, um, we're learning as we go, obviously it's evolving, but and we talked earlier about the technology resistance of patients, but there's also that tech resistance or aversion that exists on the frontline staff of in, in providers' offices. A lot of them are frustrated with their EHRs. They're not they're not really excited about uh, learning a new technology and logging in and all of that. Um, and then, of course, if it changes existing workflows, there's obviously resistance there. Um, and, and we have to show outcomes uh, because there may be some costs up front that some providers are, are not um, excited about and, and they have to just uh, see over time that the, that the improved outcomes from a value-based care perspective are leading to, to value down the road, um, sort of return on investment. And, and those models are, I think, coming more aligned. We're starting to see uh, different methods being put in place where there's not as much uh, a requirement of the staff to, to rely on the technology or change their day-to-day workflow. Um, if it can be a, uh, an arrangement where a patient is, is simply in a, in a, uh, able to transmit data on a regular basis, whether it be body weight and heart failure patient, for example, or blood pressure, if we're looking at oxygen saturation in a, in a COVID patient even, um, and, and then there's someone whose job is dedicated literally to just responding to trends in the data that are of concern, we have a proactive healthcare solution without having to change a lot what's occurring you know, in the office daily or having to require a, an adoption of technology in the office. And there's someone else that's the technician behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, and I'm interested uh, to see if any, anyone else in the panel has seen um, some, some uh, learning curve here in the process as we move towards digital care, where it's starting to get more streamlined and more efficient. And if you can share some of those strategies. Sure, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, this is Matt and Libby. Uh, we had definitely a learning experience at first. Uh, we tried to um, implement this through a chronic care management program um, with patients who are our highest risk patients, thinking they were the ones who might benefit the most. And many of them were um, older and had transportation difficulties. Um, the the uh, broadband difficulty was less of an issue, I, I think, for most of them because of the way HealthSnap's technology works and it doesn't rely on a smartphone intermediary. So that was a big benefit for us. But what we found was that many of these patients, either their provider wasn't as keen on making medication changes because maybe they were 85 years old and the goal was a little different for blood pressure, or some of the patients just cognitively couldn't um, follow the instructions on how to use the blood pressure monitors uh, or we're checking their blood pressures too often. And so we realized the population we were targeting was maybe not the population that was going to benefit the most from this in the long run. And so we um, sort of reevaluated and, and paused for a little bit to um, gather the resources together we needed to roll it out in a broader sort of more representative population for primary care um, in, in an entire panel as an initial sort of test pilot and then broadly to the whole organization soon, um, where the patients who, you know, anyone coming into the office whose blood pressure is above goal, or even just today, I had a, a nurse from one of our other clinical sites tell me one of my patients came in for a blood pressure check who lives far from where my main practice site is and um, was above goal. And I said, this is a perfect patient for the remote patient monitoring program. Um, she's not even able for an in-person nursing visit to come down to see me. So, um, getting that patient signed up and getting a cuff to them um, will make a huge difference. And I think um, when we figure out what population we're really targeting and who's going to benefit from this the most, um, that's when we see the, the most benefit. And the another thing we learned with telehealth access to a lot of our patients is it's not always 
Um, like we thought at the beginning of the pandemic, it's not always the elderly who don't want to leave their homes because of infection risk or transportation or um, other reasons. It's a lot of times the patients who are working two to three jobs um, who can't take out time off of work without you know losing pay um, and don't come into the office for that reason. You know, when we capture them and get them uh, remote off and have someone calling them to follow up with them, we're going to get these patients under much better control and they tend to be younger and have a lot more potential for um, harm down the road if they don't get their blood pressure controlled. So it's been a shift in our thinking of who we're trying to outreach and get connected to this program. Um, that, that's been one of the learning curves for sure. And you talked about tech resistance among staff or tech resistance and workflow resistance. Um, that definitely, and especially at the end, at the stage we're in right now of a pandemic um, and staffing challenges and everything, um, it can feel exhausting even for someone who's very tech literate like myself or a team nurse who I'm working with to um, onboard my patients and the health snap. Um, all of us are comfortable with the technology, not tech resistant, but still it can feel like a high activation energy to get things going when it's brand, brand new. Um, but one thing that I've seen very clearly is once you get the first couple patients onboarded and understand how the data can really um, augment your workflows and add to it and improve patient outcomes, it becomes much easier and actually you really see the benefit. So I'm excited to scale this up in our clinic um, and have everyone else see that benefit too. Just to go back to what Matt was saying. Oh, go ahead, Andy. Did you want to? Oh, I, was, I was just going to say that um, one of the things that goes along with that is um, the need to um, determine what our staffing requirements are going to be um, to make a program with remote patient monitoring sustainable just internally because we have it's multi layered. We have the providers, the, the clinicians that have to um, get on board and accept it and so on. And, and then if we have uh, nursing staff and medical assistants that are, we have to get them on board. But part of it is just finding enough minutes in the day. That's one of the things we're finding is that remote, remote patient monitoring can come with a cost in terms of now we have uh, pay, if we are with our HRSA hypertension grant, if we get up to 1500 patients or something like that, how we're going to have the time to monitor all those incoming alerts and so on. So there's some thorny questions about that in terms of the overall, the total cost of operations uh, that we have to, we have to think about as well. Andy, I would agree. I mean, I think we're looking at the same challenges on our end in terms of what the appropriate staffing model might look like, and we're really learning as we go. Um, I was just going to also speak to the idea of provider resistance, and one of the things that we have really attempted to do in our modeling um, of this of this effort is to make it uh, to unburden the the PCP, especially. Um, who, you know, our, our teams are, as many are, um, really stretched and certainly in this environment, very burned out. Um, and so, you know, we are looking for the, the easiest path forward for them where they're really, um, they'll, they, uh, they co-sign an order for patients that we've pre-identified for them based on, you know, looking, reviewing patient data and seeing who has been out of control over the last year. Um, and then, you know, having an ancillary team that's doing the monitoring um, with an RN and a PharmD that can do um, medication adjustments under a collaborative agreement, um, and then having the provider simply, you know, review that information. Um, interestingly, we're also uh, looking to, we, we also have um, a use case with our renal hypertension patients under the care of our nephrologists. Um, and in that scenario, with our specialists, we're also looking at doing something with our endocrinologists. The specialists, I think, have had a tendency to want to be more involved um, in the direct um, oversight. Uh, I think, you know, with more complex patients and more nuanced, maybe medication titrations that would go along with that, um, they seem more engaged in um, wanting to, to review the data directly um, and be, you know, be part of uh, the treatment decision um, in the, at the front line as opposed to um, as a follow-up 
uh, in the case of the primary care doctor. So that's one of the things we're finding. Yeah, I, I would I would reiterate some of that um, at Arizona Care Network. We had really started to pivot a lot of our clinical resources to being extensions of the practice, whether it was remote or actually in the practice. Um, we found that that relieved the burden uh, and really provided um, an opportunity to um, for consistency uh, and extra support for the practices. So I, I would just reiterate what you said, Dr. Stark. <clears throat> Yeah, I also think what's going to be important is to see as data uh, comes out over time, how CMS uh, evolves with these codes or expansion of these codes potentially, or when we're talking about rural access, allowing maybe um, more uh, um, commun tech communication through SMS or email to some of those areas where they have spot, they, they have the inability to do um, video conferencing or calls um, where patient reported outcomes can be more valuable for certain populations where just um, finding out how the patient's you know, symptoms are. Because for example, with the COVID patients, uh, measuring just oxygen saturation isn't enough. You need to know if, they're, if they have dyspnea, if they're high risk for other reasons, et cetera. So um, patient reported outcomes, uh, seeing those hopefully included and expanded in the remote monitoring um, codes would be uh, obviously important, but really just showing the efficacy of the system in general, showing that it is proactive and that it's preventing um, admissions and length of hospital stays and improving uh, just overall um, uh, patient outcomes. And there was a, a paper that I talk about with our group internally a lot, um, published in the British Medical, Medical Journal in 2021. I, I believe the lead author's name was Taylor. But um, anyway, it was a review of the effectiveness of remote patient monitoring and does it really reduce hospitalizations? And um, it found that about half the time, remote patient monitoring tends to be really effective, which isn't, <laughs> that's not the greatest. Uh, again, it's, the data is still coming out. I'm sure there's um, gonna be a much larger data pool to do a review on in the future. But I think that the key difference that they cited between those methods that were effective at reducing costs and improving outcomes were ones that were patient-centered and evidence-based. Um, focused uh, largely on prevention, of course. And if it was just merely just taking data from patients and providing the, that patient back to the physician um, without a real clear uh, methodology in place as to how you respond, how you triage various uh, trends in the data, et cetera, in terms of responding to the patient, then it didn't really have the effects that, that one would hope. So um, I'm interested to see payers and CMS um, looking into the solutions that are more effective and seeing if these codes expand or what changes in time. And um, um, I'm interested to see, you know, if, if, if anyone on the panel agrees with me on that or, or what your feelings are in terms of the ability of remote patient monitoring as one of the digital care um, solutions in, in preventing um, hospital admissions and things like that. Definitely, I agree that um, the payment, you know, you have to convince CMS to pay for it appropriately. Um, and by demonstrating the value, you know, we hope to be part of that um, at Outer Cape. And that's part of the reason we signed up is I can see from individual experiences with patients, I can um, see in a little bit of the, the research that I've looked into um, that you mentioned about how this can improve outcomes if it's done well, but it's not um, something you can just layer on top, like we've been talking about, without additional staffing, without um, some investment up front. And when you can demonstrate the downstream costs on a large scale, hopefully that does convince them to pay differently. And in community health, we often struggle um, because of the way Medicare and Medicaid pay us, um, that it's they're often the last ones to kind of come along with, with new codes or add-on codes um, to just the straight visits that we're already doing. And so in, in rural health, it's particularly important that the payment models um, understand the benefit of this and are willing to reimburse for it in a way that we can provide that benefit to our patients. And I, yeah. I'd like to add that um, the um, I, absolutely the data is going to be needed for the sustainability to create the sustainability model. Um, but I, I think just making the data available alone isn't going to be enough. And this is where we cross over to the area of policy 
and what's going to be needed to really push the ball over the goal line. And so th that has to do with advocacy. And it's something that we do a lot more these days. You know, you, you work at a community health center. You didn't think you'd be involved with advocacy, but we have to do it with our state and local representatives, with our federal representatives. And, you know, there are things like 340B, for instance, um, but there's certainly in terms of telehealth, it, just making the data available is that by itself isn't probably going to be enough because what we're going to have to also do is advocate for there's not a one size fits all solution to reimbursement models and there are small providers like like our community health center don't have the economies of scale available to larger health providers or networks so uh, it's, it's just one of those it's another you know one of those other tasks i think we have to be prepared to uh, to get into Yeah, I appreciate that note, Andy. And um, I think it's a good transition into kind of an open question for, for all, all five panelists here. Um, and I like this question a lot because things are changing um, rapidly in terms of innovation technology. There's, you know, every day it seems like there's another virtual care company and every day it seems like there's another solution on the marketplace, which can be overwhelming. And um, it's difficult to kind of sift through all the, the noise. There's a lot of noise right now in light of, of the pandemic. So maybe we can start off with Dr. Stark and, you know, sharing maybe one or two things that you think, or maybe recommendations or insights that you feel like will um, be key components of what you feel like um, the technology needs to continue to work towards and evolve with and starting with not just, you know, remote monitoring or telehealth version 1.0, because I do, I personally believe it will be a commodity over time as the cost of technology goes down. Um, but when you think about, you know, your system specifically, um, what's maybe words to the wise or, you know, perspective that you, you can share with either other uh, digital health companies, um, maybe other healthcare organizations that you, you feel like will be needed to be implemented to ensure that um, these are uh, implemented the right way, these programs are implemented the right way? Sure. Um, it's a big question. I, I think, um, you know, Certainly technologies that are, um, and you, know, you have to think about all of the key components, all of your end users. So for the patient, you know, ease of access and ease of use um, and, uh, you know, minimal sort of uh, minimal technology hurdles on the patient side. On the provider side, um, and I think the system side, I think the interoperability piece um, and the ability to have data shared and flowed um, through, through EMRs and have as much as possible have the workflow of the new technology be integrated um, into existing um, into existing workflows and technologies is, is I think key to, to long-term success and scalability. Um, and uh, and then I think also on the on the output side, you know, the reporting, um, the data collection, the ease of being able to review um, and uh, and refine what you're doing based on on what you're learning. Love it, Andy. Any thoughts there? Um, I, I think again, trying to have solutions that are can be appropriately scaled um, for some of the more difficult environments uh, is, is critical. Um, and for some of the, some of the, um, the patients that we're looking at. So uh, using a Bluetooth solution, as, as Matt alluded to, we, we found that the, um, the cell enabled remote uh, patient monitoring uh, blood pressure cups worked really well for us because of uh, one of the issues was was uh, broadband, but um, I think I think one of the other issues is when you're dealing with elderly patients, their ability or lack of ability to do something like pair a Bluetooth device it was going to be a, a real challenge for us. So uh, simplicity on the patient side is certainly that's key uh, from my point of view. The other thing is. And this isn't the technology per se, but in how to adopt the technology, is I think I, I think uh, organizations like HealthSnap have a role to play in terms of um, uh, organizing learning collaboratives so that we can share knowledge rapidly as things go along um, with some of the new technologies. Because 
uh, adoption is is really the uh, is in, in a rapidly changing environment is an issue for all of us, and we we can't all all be uh, early adopters, but we need to learn from the earlier adopters. So that that's a really helpful component. Yeah, that's great to hear, Andy. And I, and I was going to say another thing that hasn't been brought up, but I'm I'm looking at the time. I want to make sure we we touch on it um, with with regard to. Uh, communicating to existing clients and people that we're working with on the health snap side, but just anybody, no matter where they are working uh, in the area of remote patient monitoring, learning continuously about what methodology is most effective. One of the ones that's been most exciting for me personally is seeing how a patient who is regularly monitoring their data now is able to get feedback on that data um, where, you know, for example, if we were just to have a group of patients attend a seminar and we told them about the importance of physical activity in helping uh, manage their blood pressure, um, there's not always a, a large amount of enthusiasm or interest around that. But now, if you have patients monitoring their blood pressure and they see that after being a little bit more physically active, their blood pressure is more managed, or if they see that a stress management method that they used uh, helped um, lower that blood pressure because they're seeing their data on a regular basis, they're starting to see what types of strategies in their own lifestyle is affecting those measures. Or after that really stressful day um, and, and you know, maybe they ate in a certain way or they didn't um, get enough sleep, that they now see their data, they're getting information about that data, that augmented feedback, and it's giving them the ability to self-manage more effectively. That's, I think, a, a really key ingredient here on how these programs can, can be used to improve healthcare, um, obviously. And, and I think, you know, we've talked a lot about the aging population, but one other thing that I, I'm interested to hear um, uh, the group's thoughts on is that the younger population is getting spoiled with all of the technology available. And as they start to be more infused into um, MCCs, the multiple chronic conditions, when they start to get um, more um, uh, health uh, problems down the road, they're going to expect to have a lot more access and to have a lot more technology included in their healthcare. So, it's, we're going to start seeing a higher demand for this, I believe, too, as the younger population ends up needing increased services. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, a huge point. Um, the patient engagement piece is one that could easily get lost in implementing these kind of programs when in healthcare, especially on a large scale, we often think of it algorithmically. You know, the patient's uh, seven-day average blood pressure is above goal, so we're going to increase their medication. But in the visit where you're identifying that and whoever they're interacting with um, on our team right now, it's a nurse. Um, we are trying to have that nurse work on them, identifying smart goals. So setting a, a specific patient self-management goal that the patient will work on between now and the next visit. And that may or may not include anything medication related, but it could include reducing their salt consumption or increasing their physical activity and in a way that's specific and measurable and that they know the nurse is going to be checking in on them again in a week or two to see if they've done it and to look at their blood pressure with them and help coach them through. Um, so I think the way you implement it has to be thoughtful and has to include that. Um, and that's a, a value that's, I think we all intuitively understand, but it's hard to quantify when you're presenting the data, but it, that's key. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I think there's a growing number of employers that are trying to get ahead of the curve. Um, we had um, have Arizona Care Network still has an agreement with Intel. And, and while Intel wanted us to be very focused on you know, the, the, the employees and dependents that had chronic conditions, they, they didn't want um, services limited to just that segment of their population and obviously Intel's a an employer that's very big on technology. They really wanted us to be rolling things out to their um, to their entire population. So I think it's a great point. I, I would agree as well. Um, and for us, I mean we are, um, I think that that'll be part of our, our next frontier in terms of in, engaging all of the additional elements of self-management, I think for us, we're starting with some of the basics of, okay, let's, let's prove um, that patients with these devices are using them, that we're, that we're successful in, um, you know, managing some of the, just the, the 
you know, the structural elements of this, um, of this opportunity. And we plan to layer in more of that as well. I think for those of our patients that are already in our care management programs, that's inherently embedded in the work that's done. But for patients that are identified just for, let's say, um, a remote patient monitoring opportunity, we, we would look to layer that in. Thank you, Dr. Stark. So it looks like we have about five minutes left here before we'll have to unfortunately wrap up because this has been a very uh, diverse and healthy discussion here as we talk about virtual care and um, sustainability long-term. Um, I'll leave it up to you guys. Maybe we can wrap up with some closing thoughts, um, anything that's you know burning, passions, things that you wanna see changed, things that you're seeing great results with, things that maybe not so much and lessons learned, um, any closing thoughts um, for everyone and maybe, uh, Wes, you can open up with your perspective and then we can go through everyone and, and wrap up here. Uh, thank you, Samson. No, I, I agree. I, I love the panel. I mean, I, I think I spoke um, uh, probably too much. I'm interested to see more about what the guest speakers have to say. I just, I really, um, really appreciated the comment about the advocacy for this uh, different methodology in the virtual care methodology in chronic condition management and uh, in the value-based care. And I think that the more we see effective programs, the more everybody wins, especially the patients, which is the, obviously the goal. Um, and, and, and I hope that we can continue to have these discussions because I really do think that as we learn um, from effective programs, and there'll be some programs that aren't as effective that are trying to include some of those strategies, and we, but we learn together as, um, as a healthcare system, as, I mean, as the United States healthcare, healthcare system as a whole, and, and see which strategies are most effective and make sure that everybody understands this is the way to, to use this uh, and implement this with diff different demographics. So I, I, I really enjoyed um, our discussion this morning. I'll just chime in to say that I think it's important and part of our structure is to, you know, is to try to really do some rigorous evaluation on the impact um, of utilizing these technologies. So we're, you know, looking at both um, near term outcomes, um, things around disease progression, um, meeting certain clinical targets, um, as well as, you know, trying to also evaluate um, some of the bigger ticket um, utilization. Uh, items so that we can, um, you know, really have um, a robust, um, hopefully ROI for, for this type of opportunity going forward um, so that we can incorporate it as broadly as possible into our, into our value-based agreements. And I'd like to um, touch on a point that I don't think we've hit too much, and that has to do with, with equity. Uh, I'm, the, the technology, I have no doubt, is going to continue to mature. Uh, the adoption rate is going to continue to increase at, at all levels. What I'm concerned about is some of our marginalized populations who are hard to reach, and I'm afraid we're not going to be able to reach as well unless we have some, some different strategies. I'm thinking about homeless populations. I'm thinking about migrant workforce uh, that are frequently from offshore or near shore and they live in enclaves, um, speak a different language and so on. I'm thinking of people with severe and persistent mental illness. Uh, there are a lot of marginalized uh, populations that stand to be left out uh, of, the, of this revolution and we gotta figure ways to reach them and get the technology in their hands and have them be able to use it. So I think that's gonna be a major challenge. It's such an important point. I really, um, I'm really glad to hear you say that because I think that's, it needs to be emphasized more and more every time these discussions occur. The equity element for sure. I'm grateful we brought this group together um, because the Health Snap is developing the technology and um, working with um, different partners from a, a broad range of healthcare settings. So you have the advantage of Dr. Stark and a large system and able to collect some of that data and demonstrate that value um, over a large number of patients and very broad swath of the population. And then how does that inform reimbursement policy all the way down to you know, a community health center, small individual practice level across the whole health system? And how do you tailor that, um, you know, the things we learn at that scale, um, tailor the approach to fit 
the different local conditions somewhere like Outer Cape, um, where we care for you know, a specific population that it's also broad, but involves rural and elderly and underserved and um, homeless, as Andy was mentioning, marginalized. So um, really mixing all that together, having these kind of discussions where everyone can share their different experiences and um, help learn how to work together to move forward is really important. So thank you. Couldn't agree more, Matthew. And I think uh, diverse perspectives are always the best ones. Um, different thinking always helps everyone, I think, come together with a common alignment and, and think about this long term. Um, Conley, I think you'll be the last one for closing thoughts, and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up here. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add. I think it was a great discussion. And um, I, I, I agree. I think that um, um, you know, figuring out how to enable this um, technology across multiple different patient populations will um, not only improve the data, but help with the adoption. I think it's been a great discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you, thank you, thank you, all of our amazing guest speakers uh, joining us today and for taking the time with us out of your busy schedules. Um, I wish everyone has a great rest of their days and weeks. Um, we'll go ahead and circulate this recording as well so you can share it uh, with your networks. Uh, and looking forward to the next one. Thank you guys so much again. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.